rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome those that are watching this TV program this morning to stay with us and be blessed by the preaching of God's Word. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible says that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. This morning, one of the things takes place in our lives, in all per people's lives, one time or another, is that we miss someone or we miss things that we're accustomed to. You know, when I went to Haiti uh, for a little, little while uh, and was down there for maybe a couple of days, I began missing uh, some things. You know, uh, missing how nice I had it back here. Missing being able to jump in the shower or to be able to shave or to eat and drink things without having to be so cautious that it takes so much time before you get to eat. Then I miss my wife and my children. See, in this life, we miss things. What about you this morning? Has there been things that you have missed in your life? Maybe you've missed your wife, your husband, or your kids, or grandma and grandpa, and etc. Are there things that you have missed in your life? We are. We're people in this life that there are things that we miss. But what, what, did I, what about when it comes to missing God? Did we miss Him? You know, we go through every day of our lives. There's seven days a week. And, and for the most part of it, we're awake. We get our times that we get to go to sleep and rest. But do we ever miss God? It would be the question. You know, I'm sure if I uh, went back to Haiti for a couple weeks or a month or whatever it took, or so went with Barry over to Africa, it would come a little time when my wife would begin to miss me. And I would begin to miss her too. But what about you? And what about me? Is there ever time that we miss God? Now, I know we can't uh, talk to Him verbally and Him speak back verbally. He, he could, but he chooses not to. Or can we sit in front of one another and look at one another eye to eye as we do right now with God? No, it can't be done yet because he chooses not to. So if we can't be around someone and speak to them and see them, can we miss them? Can we miss them? Well, that's a hard question. I, I, really, I really have to say that's a hard question. But I do miss God. How do I miss Him? Well, when I don't get to study His Word, I miss it. I miss it. Just like when I'm away from my wife, I miss her. My grandkids, you know, about a week, about a week away from them, I miss them. Do I miss God in His Word? And it's only because of I miss that do I want to, con to get back into that fellowship with Him and to study and be close to Him. But if you're not missing God, you will not study His Word because it won't mean anything to you. You see, our relationships with husbands and wives and our kids, that means something to us. And so therefore we try to make it better and better and better as we go. But what about our relationship to our God? He is alive, the Bible said. He's true and He's living. And you can look around and see that if God were not alive, this world would not be as it is. You see, it would be worse. <laughs> it would be total chaos this world would be in. It's because of God. It's because of Jesus, the Son of God. It's because of the Holy Spirit. It's because of His divine Word. It's because of those who have been obedient to His divine Word. The church is the reason that there's still the essence of God's love in this world today. But if you take all that way, 
take all that away, and God is going to one day, this world will be in total chaos. A lot worse than what it is now. So what about our missing God? Would that be important to you? Wouldn't it be important to you if your husband and your wife uh, had a good relationship and your kids? Or may, maybe the husband or the wife or the kids decide that they're going to go away for a while, not tell anybody where they're at or how they're doing. How would it be for you then? You wouldn't like it, would you? No, it would be a strain on your heart. You would miss them and you would worry about them and you'd be grieved. But too many times today in the Lord's church, people aren't grieved. Their heart's not aching because of they're not having the right fellowship with God. They're not spending the right time with God. Well, preacher, who are you to say that I don't spend time with God? Well, I'm not the one saying that. God is. And it's in His Word. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Just study to show thyself approved unto God. That's what God wants you to do, both male and female in the church. God wants you to study His Word and approve yourself to Him. That's what He wants. As well as meet around the Lord's table, He wants that. As well as give your tithes and offering, He wants that. As well, in order to become a part of His church, you have to repent of your sins and be baptized. He wants His church to study to show themselves approved unto Him. You see, God does show that favoritism. God does show favoritism. Because God shows more favoritism on those who study to show themselves approved to Him than those who don't. By way of blessings. God blesses the Christian who will take the Bible and do their dead level best to serve God the way the Bible says. God will not bless the Christian who will not do, go take the Bible and do their dead level best to serve Him the way the Bible says. You see, God's ears open to those who are obedient to Him. But those who are disobedient to him, his ears is closed. You see, God shows favoritism, and he is just in doing it, okay? Yeah, what about our missing God? You see, what, what, if, you, what if it ever took place that <clears throat> you had to go to some foreign country and you tried your, tried your best to serve God the way the Bible says, and there's not a whole lot of people over there who do that. And week after week began to go by, and there was no one, there was no one who came together and came around the Lord's table like you did at home. Okay? There was no one there that gave of their tithes and offerings, and the help was there when anyone in the church needed it at home. What about that? You would miss it. You would miss it. Well, what about missing God? In order for uh, a Christian not to miss God, they would have to think that he's not even alive. They would have to say he's dead. He's not even alive. He's just nothing. You know, we, we, we drive by and walk down these streets and these homes and these church buildings, they got these here, these uh, stone, stone graven images of Paul and Mary and etc. And we look at them and we laugh about it because that's all it is, a stone. If you hit it with a big steel ball, they crumble into powder. Sometimes, that's what we show to the true and living God. You see, do we miss him? Do we miss him enough that we do everything we can to get back to him? Is the question. You see, God misses us. You know, God shows that in his word that when a Christian does not obey him and does not have fellowship with him and they begin to backslide, 
God misses that person. Jesus misses that person. And when they repent and turn back, come back to the Lord, there is an angelic, great angelic host in heaven singing because of one sinner came to repentance. You see? That's how our God is. But let's turn the, the picture around a little bit. Now, let's see how God looks at things. If you'll take your Bibles and go to Exodus chapter 20. You ever been jealous? You ever been jealous? Oh, maybe, maybe uh, before your marriage you had a boyfriend or you had a girlfriend. And one or the other was taking a liking to another uh, boy or girl. And you get angry. That's jealousy. You know, that's my man or that's my woman. And they're flirting around someone else. I'm not good enough. I get jealous. Maybe you got married. And the wife or the husband is uh, recognizing some other man or woman more than they are you. Then you begin to get jealous. Maybe as a husband and a wife, it was all good at the beginning. You know, Joanne and I first got married, all I can think about was getting off work and going and being with her. I know when I got home, the, she felt the same way because there was little notes pinned on the refrigerator, the door, and on the cabinets and stuff telling me how she felt about me. But as time goes on, little things come in between us and we start paying a little bit more attention to that. And they see there's a problem because it's not like it was in the beginning. And begin to get jealous. Begin to get jealous. And rightly so. Rightly so. Because this kind of jealousy began with God. It's a characteristic of God. God who has always been. There's no beginning with God. He has no mother, no father. He has always been. And yet, he has the characteristics of jealousy that has always been. It did begin with us or man. What about you? You ever been jealous? How'd it make you feel? Oh, doesn't it break your heart? Yeah. Doesn't it make you cry sometimes and make you angry? At one time you want to go show them how much you love them to win them back? Or other times you want to go just beat them on the head until they're dead? Well, that's a characteristic of God. And let's go to Acts chapter 20, starting with verse 1. Or Exodus chapter 20, I'm sorry. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God. He is your Lord and God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. Listen to that. We can't have these here statues of Paul and Mary and these things. God says don't have them. That's what he says right there. We can't have these little monuments and little things in our homes that have female as angels. Because it says that right there. Now, if God says that there were no uh, male angels, He would have put it right there. Yeah, we kind of say, wait a minute, preacher. You're going overboard now. No, that's what the Bible says. I'm not going overboard. God is doing the talking there. You can read it for yourself. It's in His Word. He says, for them things not to be. He says, thou shalt not make any unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. This is the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them 
that love me and keep my commandments. God is a jealous God. He was jealous over the children of Israel back in the Old Testament. No other nationality. And when, when as many did, when, when they, they were serving God and keeping His commandments, God was well pleased with them. He washed over them like a hen with her chicks. But when His people began to mix it up with other nationalities, their sons marrying other daughters of other nationalities, and their daughters marrying sons of other nationalities, they began to even Saul, King Saul, had so many wives of other nationalities that he began serving their gods too. And God became jealous. And he became angry. And God at times, he gave him, he was, he was a just God, he gave him time to repent. For those who did, he forgave them. He blessed them. And he went walked with them. But for those who would not repent, God destroyed them in some fashion or another. He not only was jealous, but he came angry and he destroyed them. And God was just in doing that. What about us today? Do we miss our God? Now listen to what I'm saying. You have to be able to understand in order to keep from doing that which makes God jealous and angry. Do you miss your God? I'm talking about we can't see Him or talk to Him verbally and Him back to us. But we can talk to Him in prayer and He can and will talk to us through His Word. How long has it been, Christian? How long has it been? You know, the Bible from the Old Testament to the New talks about God being the husband and his people or the church today as being the wife. Christian, you're the wife. Both male and female in the church is the bride. How long has it been you, have you been with your husband who is God or the Lord Jesus Christ? How long has it been? Has it been a long time? And been a long time, have you begun missing Him? Have you begun missing Him? You see, you need to ask yourself that question. I need to ask myself that question. If I'm missing my God, I need to repent and turn back and begin having fellowship with my husband, who is God. And I'm His bride. And he will have fellowship with me. And there will be no jealousy. Okay? You don't have to worry about your husband who is the Lord Jesus Christ, church, stepping out on you. But he has to worry about us stepping out on him because we're the one that chooses not to have fellowship with him. We're the one that chooses not to spend time with our husband who is God. We're the one that decides that we're not going to spend time with him. And then he gets jealous. And we're the one that brings it up on ourselves. God never brings that up on us. James chapter 1, the Bible says that every good gift and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. God never does anything. God never says anything. God never gives us anything that will hurt us. Everything that comes from God is always good for us. In Exodus chapter 34 and verse 14. <clears throat> Let's just start in verse 12. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest. Talk about the land of, uh, land of Canaan. And there were many of those, like the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, that were not of God's people, were there inhabiting that land. And he said, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be a snare in the midst of thee. 
But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves, for thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God, you see. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods. And one called thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods. Make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. Thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. God, one of, name, one, one of the names of God is Jealous, it says there. That's what he is. Yeah, it begin, begin with men. It's one of the characteristics of God. He's a jealous God. Do you know that when we spend more time with other people, or other things than we do with God that we make a covenant with them in agreement? Do you know that it's called going a whoring after other gods? Now I know this is not polite to say but I've talked about in other sermons how would you like to be called a liar? I wonder if I come and called you a liar right now. How well would that go over? Probably wouldn't go over very well at all, would it? But what if God says that J. Jones was a liar? Be different, wouldn't it? If God calls me a liar. What about if God says if J. Jones spends more time on the TV or the computer or on the radio or J. Jones spends more time with the people of the world than with God's people? Or if J. Jones spends more time at work than he does with God and his word. What does God call that? He's saying that J. Jones is going to hoin after these things. God calls J. Jones because of him doing that. that I'm a whore. We know what a whore is. A woman or a man who wants many women or many men and that's what their life is based upon. Well, that's what it is for the Christian who does not spend time with their husband, who is God, and building that relationship up so that he can be the God whom they need and we can be the bride whom God wants. Isn't that what it's supposed to be? Yeah, when we get married, yeah, he's my husband. He, I want him to be the husband that I love. And she's my wife. And I want her to be the wife that I love. We belong to each other and no one else. That's the way God looks at His church, His people, the Christian. We belong to Him and no one else. That's what He means by that. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, if you'll turn over there with me please. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 24. Take heed unto yourselves, talk to the children of Israel, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image or a likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. He's a consuming fire, but he's also a jealous God. And, he, and we're warned to take heed, lest we forget the covenant that he made with us. Do you know by hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ from the Word of God and being taught the plan of salvation that we find in the Bible and then you accept it and obey it. You made an agreement. You made a covenant and so did I. 
that we would continue obeying God's commands and loving Him and serving Him and let Him lead us and guide us in this life and into the next. That's the covenant agreement we made with our God. Every one of us that was lured into the watery grave of baptism, we made a covenant with God. We told Him that we would obey His commands and His statutes. We would do what He tells us to do. And He in return would provide for us, bless us, lead us and guide us, protect us, give us everything we need. And then the promise of eternal life with Him someday in heaven if we're faithful unto death. That's what our God or our husband who is God has done. What about us? We're to take heed lest we forget that covenant. Have you forgotten that covenant? Do you remember the day when you heard the gospel? And you got up and was excited because you no longer had to be the person you used to be and live in the sin that you lived in that was taking you to hell. But you could obey the Lord and repent of your sins, be baptized, and He promised to wash away every sin and remember them no more. And He wiped the slate clean, give you a new life, you become a new creature in Christ to serve God. Our husband, who is God. See, that's what husbands do. Yeah, we made a covenant with him. Have we forgot it? When we forget to keep that covenant, God becomes jealous. Chapter 6 of Deuteronomy and verse 15. Starting with uh, uh, verse 12. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And he brought each one of you all out of bondage, and me too. When we repented of our sins, was baptized, he brought us out of the world, out of the power of Satan, and out of all our way to going to hell. That's what God did for us. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and shalt swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods, of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Do you ever think, do I ever think, when I spend more time with someone else or other things that makes God jealous makes our husband the husband of the church who is God makes him jealous and that he misses us and because he provides every way to bring to our attention to turn us back to him and we just still yet refuse well For the Lord our God is a jealous God among you. Do we ever think that his anger gets kindled against us? You know, here some preachers say that God never gets angry. (laughs) Here some preachers say that he's he's just loving all the time, smiles all the time, and there's hearts just, you can feel it coming up out of him. You can see him in the air, how loving God he is. That's the way some people think about God. But you know, if when we make him jealous, he gets angry. And his wrath gets kindled against us. Do you know just because a person repents of their sins and they have been baptized, don't you know that hell will be full of people like that? Because they make God jealous. His jealousy makes him angry and his wrath is kindled against us such as it was in the Old Testament. Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24.
and verse 19. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for He is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then He will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, He has done you good. What about us as the church today? Each individual Christian, are you, do you think that you're ever in this situation? So think about it, ain't it? Yeah. Do you know if I come to you and tell you that you're wrong or something, that your defenses go up? Yeah, they do. Yeah, and then what happens? If I don't stop, you turn an ear to it, a deaf ear to it, quit listening. Yeah. That's what we do. And that's what we do God. Yeah, we just pointed out in the Bible that just because we've been baptized, we're God's people, we can't never do no wrong. I don't know how many people said, you think you're perfect. And I'm the last one who thinks that. Well, that's a two-way street. <laughs> See, it's a two-way street. There are times that all of us think we're better than the other person. Or I can't never do no wrong. But when we look at through the eyes of God, we all feel condemned because we do not obey His commands. We do not do what He says. But also we ought to feel blessed because we do. We serve a holy God. The most holy God. The holiest of all. And He wants holiness out of His people. No, He don't want us to be perfect like Him until we get there. But He does want us to become more like Christ every day. And how do we do that? By spending time with Jesus and His Word. That's how we do that. We become more perfect the more we study God's Word. We become less perfect when we do not study God's Word. We have to understand that. If we understand that, if I want to become more like Christ, every day I can become more like Christ. And I hope that's the goal of every Christian. Well, then every day I've got to spend time with Jesus and His Word. Every day. And it ought to bother us to the point to realize that I'm making my husband jealous. Think about that. <laughs> this may be more of a woman thing than it is a man thing. You know, when you first get married or, or something like that, and you, 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 want your, you want your husband to spend more time to, on, on you, and you might play a little game to make him jealous. You ever done that? Make him jealous on purpose. Most of the time it's, it, it doesn't do a whole lot of harm, but sometimes it does. But what about when we make God jealous? Yeah, there are Christians who make God jealous. And they don't realize they're doing it. Why? Because they don't understand the Word of God. They don't understand the Word of God. When you truly have a relationship with God and His Word, you know automatically in your own mind at any given time whether I am pleasing God or I'm displeasing Him. And you don't need a preacher to tell you that you're doing it. You know it. And God knows it, you see. In Nahum chapter 1, if we can find that. We don't usually go there very much, do we? Chapter 1 and, and uh, verse 2. Where's it at? Okay. Oh, that's Nehemiah. 
Is it up there by Daniel? Right before Habakkuk. Where's that at? <laughs> uh, I think you're okay. There we go. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Think about that. Don't you know you can be a child of God? And if we make God jealous, and we continue in that, and we continue in that, that soon we become his enemy, the enemy of God. Then James chapter 1 say, or chapter 4 say that if we love the world, that we are the enemy of God. He's talking to the church. If we love the world, the things of the world, we are an enemy of God. It's in James chapter 4. We become his enemy when we make him jealous. And he tries everything, even through the preaching of God's word to get us to, to turn from that and repent and come back to Him. But we can become His adversary, His enemy, and He'll destroy us. Yeah, things can happen in this life, but He's talking about an eternal life. <clears throat> in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, Such as, in verse 20, starting with verse 25. In the eyes of the world, my friend, this is important. And to some in the church, the Lord's church today, this is not important. It doesn't seem like it's that important. But God thinks it is, and His Word thinks it is. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another is so much more that you see the day approaching. Talking about the first day of the week. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Jesus is not going to die on the cross again and shed his blood and offer sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fire indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. How much more sore punishment suppose ye, the church, shall ye be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, hath counted the count of the blood of the covenant where he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. Vengeance belongeth to God. He will make recompense. What about us today as the Lord's people? Do we ever stop to consider that we might be breaking God's heart, making him jealous? Because whether we like to hear this or not. If we're, we're spending our time somewhere, we're spending our time with someone or some people and not with God, we're making him jealous. We're making him jealous. Do you ever think about you might make him jealous and break his heart? Make him feel like you would feel if your husband or your wife was messing with someone else? See, God calls that going a whoring that around. I don't want to be called a whore. Do you? No, I want to be called the bride of Christ. <laughs> like the Bible says. I don't want to make my God jealous. Because he promised to take care of me. Through thick and thin. See, he, pro he cherishes me. He promised to 
uh, bless me and provide like a husband's supposed to. He promised to give his life for me, and he did. You see, and he promises to see me through until the end. That's the vows we make when we're married, till death do us part. And then he still promises us to be with us after that. What about you this morning? You made God jealous as a Christian? If so, you need to repent. You need to repent of that. Turn back to God. Get back with God. How to do that? By studying His Word. By spending time in prayer with Him. Allow Him to excite you and mold you and make you. Get you back into God's family. Be the excited Christian you need to be. Be a one who when the world looks at they see Jesus in you. That's what God wants. This morning, if you're not a Christian, the Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. By believing that message, one repents of their sins. Repentance is a change of mind and conduct toward the way that you're living and you turn back towards God. The Bible says one must be baptized by immersion to have your sins washed away and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not to help you speak in tongues and do miracles, but to help you live a faithful life unto Jesus and His Word unto the end. If you are a Christian this morning, God speaking to you through His Word and through the Holy Spirit, and you know you need to make a change. Why don't you do that this morning by repenting of, of that sin and turning back to God. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, If we'll confess our sins to Him, which is Jesus, He is just and He's faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that good news?